Okay. Uh, Mr. Garda, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your childhood? How was your education? Where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in Oslo, Norway, and uh, I would say that maybe the most profound and important uh, uh, background sort of from my, my childhood was that I grew up in a house, in the family, with parents who had books in the house, who also had time to read to the children. I think today in the modern world it's even more important to read to the children, sharing experience uh, across the generations. Also, I was uh, uh, in a family with very liberal parents. A liberal uh, in the sense that I met all sorts of people at home. Uh, my, my fr the friends of my, my parents were communists, ultra-conservative, and when they were together they were you know, arguing, and it was really tough arguing, but I learned very young toleration. I, I learned that he's a very nice man, a nice uncle, although he has uh, views I or my parents didn't share at all, you know. And, and this was in the McCarthy period when it was, you know, really, really uh, terrible to be a communist. My parents never were a communist, but uh, this dialogue was very important. And I remember I was laying awake in the bed when I was a small child. Uh, I didn't want to go to sleep because I loved to hear the voice of, of the, my parents, the glasses and the piano playing. So, um, have you been um, a special child or a child which um, people, maybe your classmates or your parents thought that, uh, that you are different than other childs or did you feel yourself maybe that you are different or you have been a very normal child, so to speak? Uh, I would say both and. You see, uh, uh, when I was uh, four, five and six years old, for a couple of years, I absolutely was a little different from other children because I, I was sort of asocial, you know. Uh, I remember myself, it was talking about as a problem with my parents in the kindergarten, you know, that I was not actually taking part in the games. Uh, I was uh, just sitting, watching, uh, thinking, but I was not unlucky. Uh, this was presented to me from my parents as a problem. Why, why don't you take part in the games? Uh, but, but I remember I was completely happy, you know. Then, after, after six, seven years old, I think I was a very, very normal uh, boy, uh, playing football and, you know, uh, uh, skis and, and ski running. Uh, but when I became 15, 16 years old, I had this very, very strong experience being all of a sudden part of a mystery. Uh, the, the existence, the universe, it was like an enigma, uh, uh, and, and, and I, I was amazed that I was the only among my comrades that really had this feeling. I said, don't you think it's, it's, it's really weird that we, we, we exist, uh, that the universe exists? Well, maybe, you know, that was the reply I got. So, uh, but apart from that, uh, I would say that I think I was a very normal child and young man, but I've kept that very inspiration of, of like uh, being part of a revelation that has been an uh, inspiration for me all my life. Do you think that um, our conventional education is uh, kind of programming ourselves in a particular way and maybe even uh, uh, making a deformation uh, so that maybe uh, most of the children um, are born um, almost as geniuses? Uh, and uh, their potential then is crashed down by the way their parents may educate them, the school system especially uh, deforms them. Could you um, add something mm. to this? Or? Well, first of all, I would say that uh, in, in the Norwegian language, we actually uh, uh, have two words for education. Uh, one word, which means to learn, to know, to understand, to manage, to do things like that. But the other word is to be uh, like uh, maybe the German word uh, Bildung, uh, is, uh, to, to be created a human being. Just like Erasmus of Rotterdam, the Renaissance humanist, he said that horses are born, human beings are not born, they are made. Yes, I think uh, that uh, I feel very often that uh, the, uh, the curiosity of the little child may be crushed down by the school system in uh, many places. Uh, I think we, we are really, I mean, sort of born philosophers. We are born curious, we ask a lot of questions, uh, like uh, what, what is behind the stars, why does the elephant have such a long nose, and the children are saying, I don't know, and now you must go to bed, you know, like that. So I think that this natural curiosity, 
it will it will be it can be kept alive. Let me just give one uh, uh, example. In Norway, we have a, a, a phenomenon we call baby swimming, which means that you take a newborn baby mm -hmm. and you just run with this newborn baby from the hospital, so to say, to the <laughs> nearest uh, swimming pool and you throw the child into the water and it's swimming. Mm -hmm. Because it's born in water. It's an inborn ability to swim. But if we don't keep that tended, then the child will have to learn again to swim uh, eight years later. The same, I would say, about... Uh, uh, about uh, playfulness, about curiosity, uh, about uh, the artistic talents of children, uh, it's very much a question of keeping it tended. Then also I must say that I for many, many, many years have been teaching in a very special school we have only in Scandinavia. It's an it's a optional year after high school where there is no curriculum, uh, no exam, uh, and, and, and the school day is sort of organized uh, b b from the teachers and the students uh, and the living interaction between the, the student and the teacher is very important and it's liberal arts, it's, 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 it's subjects you study for your, your life, for your lifetime. Uh, so that is a, a free boarding school, uh, not very many people go there but that gave me an idea of another pedagogic mm -hmm. than the official. So how did you find your vocation and when and how did it happen that you suddenly, did it come up suddenly to you that you know that you want to be a philosopher, a writer or was it a long way where you uh, had to choose uh, a lot of different alternatives? Well I was uh, stu uh, studied first Norwegian language and literature, you know, to, to be a teacher so to say. But then uh, being so interested in this uh, universal, you know, riddles, I, I studied philosophy and history of religions. And at the same time, when I was a student, I, I, I started to write. And I wrote a novel. And I, I thought myself, this novel was, uh, it was genius. <laughs> it was, uh, I, I, I think it was very important, you know, and I wrote and wrote, I think it was 500 pages when I sent it to the publishing house and then I got it back and I was very very disappointed uh, of course because they wouldn't publish it uh, but it's, uh, it learned me something I think maybe very important for young people because I, I did one mistake I didn't let anybody read it I would say to young people who wants to write write and let from an early stage other people read it so, so I got disappointed and the second uh, uh, advice would be never give up try again and I did and then uh, everything was very successful, I would say, and I have been extremely lucky as I also uh, experienced that my books were translated into many, many different languages. So I'm very privileged, and, uh, but it was a long run because I, I, I also know exactly how it is to, to become really, really crushed down and disappointed. If we speak here at the forum, for instance, about education, uh, then it's uh, something which is just addressing basically the intellect, the ratio. Uh, but to become a human being, a full human being, uh, and, and to search for wisdom, uh, you have to uh, listen to your heart. You have to, uh, because wisdom sits according to many traditions in the heart. So what would you suggest uh, to change our educational system that we that we reach more wisdom versus just learning knowledge, so to speak, or get information? I think that uh, very important is to, to sort, of, sort of encourage, estimate young people uh, uh, to, to reflect on values, for instance. I mean, philosophy, you know, uh, uh, is uh, sort of uh, a lot of questions divided in two groups. One group are the big questions about the universe and God, and you know, uh, uh, this, this, that is more left uh, to, uh, to science now, today. The other, other uh, 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 you know, group of questions are questions like, what is happiness? What, is, what are the real values? What is a just society? Uh, what is love? Uh, what is compassion? Now, these questions don't have any specific answer. But all individuals and all generations, uh, all countries, they have to ask this question because you cannot expect to, to, to experience happiness without in the first place asking what is happiness or achieving the real, for you, the real values. Uh, I think that when I was in school we, we never ever had uh, any room 
for, for reflection. We were, were taught Christian religion, Christian ethics, but it was something we were taught, nothing we could sort out ourselves in dialogue with the teacher. It never ever, for instance, I experienced in school that the teacher asked the children, what would you like to do when you are adults, for profession, for work? Never ever that question uh, was, was asked. Uh, and I think uh, it should be maybe the number one question to ask uh, small children. And also, if, if, if I can imagine that question, you know, <laughs> was asked, and then, okay, the one girl, what to do will you be? I will become a teacher. Mm -hmm. Good. Or you? I will become a baker. Okay, very well. And you? I will, uh, I, I, I will uh, become a missionary. Oh, very good. You know, like that. And then, uh, for, and you? For Hilde, for hand. What about you? I will be a dancer. And then the children would laugh, the teacher would laugh, but they shouldn't. So dance, dance, you know, and, and, and start early like that. So this sort of, this sort of encouragement, I think, uh, was very poor when I was in school. But of course, things have improved today. But many young people today, they don't really know, it seems, what they want. So maybe because of a wrong education, that they are afraid to, to listen to their heart, uh, but it seems they need some orientation or uh, assistance uh, to find their vocation. So um, that they don't just choose a profession and in some ways it's not in accordance with their uh, in a call, so to speak. So, uh, how, what could be done uh, to help young people to find their real vocation and then choose the right profession according to the vocation? I, of course, then very much believe in the very dialogue, you know, between between the teacher, for instance, or parents and the child, uh, because of course, uh, children then need help to sort things out. But I think uh, we shouldn't forget also that uh, the child itself should be encouraged to make his or her own decisions to choose what way to go, you know? Uh, so I, I think that uh, uh, the funny thing today is that when I was in school, now I'm in high school, we, we were talking, then we were talking. Some people wanted to become teachers, some be wanted to become nurses or doctors, like that, you know? Uh, today, if you actually go today to high school in Oslo and ask people what they want to become, they will say, famous and rich. <laughs> and, 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 and I mean, uh, and really, uh, of course, they are uh, uh, winking with their eyes, but, but a little bit, but, but that is, I think uh, we live in a society where fame, you know, human beings are very vain, and, and even more in our society than, than the previous societies. So, so I think there may be uh, some reason can, could also be told about uh, the vanity <laughs> oh. But as a philosopher, how would you explain this phenomena? What, what is causing that young people are just have these ideas now? Uh, is this a lack of mm, uh, identity, of the real identity? Or what, what is yeah. the behind? I, I think that at least I would really emphasize that uh, 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 keeping, uh, you know, the identity is very important, and I think that we we we, we uh, uh, is is uh, sort of losing parts of our identity, and that may create this uh, uh, this desire for fame. Also, because you know, there is much more entertainment industry than before. People are actually watching screens, whether television screen or or internet screen, very much more, and I think uh, this uh, really can sort of. Uh, uh, empty us, just like the alcoholic who said in one of his bright moments, he said, before I was drinking from the bottle, now the bottle is drinking from me. Uh, and I think actually uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, the television also can, can em empty you, so to say. Uh, but, you know, uh, the, the identity is my key word, because, uh, uh, of course, much of your identity is the, in the family. You grow up, of course. And I think it's important to have a family identity. But also, I think that national identity, I mean, there are negative aspects of nationalism, but in general, I would say that uh, to belong to a nation is a very positive thing. I mean, uh, for instance, very much of what is me is based on Norwegian fairy tales, my parents told me. 
uh, the old uh, uh, Norse sagas, uh, like uh, you know songs, and that is uh, a very important part of my mind. I am also, of course, I also have as an adult today very much a, a global identity because I also belong to Earth and to mankind. Uh, I think uh, uh, I'm afraid that the globalization of the world may weaken the the national identity, and I think it's very important. I think things will. So I think that uh, the, the local community, I think that will maybe be very strong in the future society. Uh, and the global society will be strong too, but the national identity will maybe lose, and we have to keep some national identity. But there are so many identities. Uh, we have an identity as a man, as a woman. Uh, we have a local identity from the location we come from. We have a national identity, an ethnic identity. We are white or black or yellow or whatever. And we have maybe a global identity. So how, how do you integrate all these identities? Uh, is there a unification and a possibility to integrate this? Or are we switching between identities permanently? So what, what are we authentically? How do we find our authenticity? I think this is a very in, uh, important question. So I, would, I would emphasize that it's extremely important in a modern globalized society to have this, 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 this uh, uh, gr ground identity, profound identity in a local community. Because if you don't really take part in a local uh, community, local cultural life, if you don't really take part there, well, you are considered to be a fool, that's one thing, if you just want to be fashionable and, and sort of a member of the world. But, but besides, without having firm roots in a, a, a local environment, local community, you, you would lose notions or concepts to, 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 to confront yourself with the global world. Uh, look at history. All real contributions to the world community, to the world civilization, they have had firm roots in a local community. I mean, uh, uh, Dostoevsky didn't become the great uh, novelist uh, in spite of being Russian, but because he was Russian and knew uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg, you know. And you can, uh, I think that people living in the big metropoles uh, uh, today, in the western big, big cities, they are maybe in danger of, of uh, not having this uh, really bound to earth uh, identity. But now already more than 50% of world population is living in, in these huge cities. So uh, the urbanization of our planet is rapidly going forward. And uh, technology and media play such an important role. Um, so. Uh, in some ways we are driven away more and more from the concept which you just described as a very important one. So what, uh, in this context, what, what could be done that there is a certain balance kept at least? Uh, well, uh, you see, I, I definitely think that uh, more and more people, they uh, belong to the global civilization, so to say. But then I think it's important to have a foot in, in, two, in both the two camps, both the local and the international. Okay, uh, so many people live in big cities now, but we see also in the big cities a renaissance for local assembly, local community. For instance, uh, poetry cafes, uh, philosophy cafes, you know. Uh, I think that uh, the globalization uh, also creates the need of meeting people. Let's take a poet. He may sell only or she sell 200 copies of the book of poetry. Uh, but he, he may gather, in Norway for instance, thousands of people for a reading. And I think uh, we have more, many places more and more festivals, you know, that is concrete meeting places, concrete uh, marketplaces, so to say. In old societies, uh, people were actually meeting at the marketplace and they were exchanging not only goods but also thoughts and ideas. Uh, now, a lot of this happens, of course, now in the uh, television and in, in the internet and in, in, in the global society. But I'm quite convinced that out of some of these small, local, let's say, poetry cafes and so on, there will be uh, uh, something new that, is, that emerges, something new that w will be conveyed to, to the world civilization. Just like at a period of time, philosophers like Jean-Paul Sartre in fr France went to this specific cafe, you know, 
and, and, and out of the chat, the talking, leading people together, he actually delivered, conveyed something to the world community. So I, I definitely think that it, in the future, uh, it will not be uh, at the big film companies in Hollywood or the big media institutes in Atlanta or anywhere. It will, new, really worthful things, new values and ideas will emerge from, from the grassroots, so to say, in a local community. As always, I imagine very much of what we today uh, uh, combine with words like art and philosophy and science, very much has roots in a very, very tiny little uh, 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 town in Greece, namely Athens. <laughs> you know, what they worked out there had such a strong impact. And I think it, it shows that uh, uh, never underestimate the ability of local, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, com community and, 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 and the possibility of, of really, you know, creating something which is interesting also for other people. They say that uh, Goethe was maybe the last person which was a scientist and artist at the same time. And after this, uh, there was a separation in science and arts as different fields. Do you think that there is a convergence again between uh, science, technology and the arts and religion maybe? Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, uh, we have seen, uh, as you say, Goethe was maybe the last scientist and, and artist. Uh, but I think we today see also the opposite uh, uh, process. Uh, for instance, a lot of, of, of old philosophical questions are today not anymore being debated by philosophers, but by scientists. Uh, I, I would say that many of the greatest thinkers, uh, scientists, uh, the, of, the, of the 20th century were also, uh, you know, they had a lot of human imagination. I mean, it, 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 uh, uh, Einstein uh, or Stephen Hawking uh, were not only uh, uh, physicists, but, but actually philosophers, thinkers, I mean thinkers. Uh, and of course, uh, science should never ever discuss God or God, the existence of God. We have always thought that. Well, today they do. And a man like Stephen Hawking can say that he's searching for the fingerprints of God in the universe. Uh, so, so I think that uh, there are examples also that uh, uh, more human uh, values, human questions, uh, even also the, uh, I mean, also thinking is an art. And, and if you are a, a physicist or astronomist, or, or, or you, you have to think, and you need fantasy. And the big physicists in the 20th century, they had this uh, really ability to, to think with no boundaries, with uh, fantasy, imagination. So what is the source of your creativity, of your fantasy? After, first of all, I must say that uh, fantasy, imagination, is a human, uh, I mean, it's a universal phenomenon. We, we all uh, have fantasy. We all, every night, for a couple of hours per night, we dream. We sort of make a theater in our own head, uh, 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 showing our existential situation. And I'm very fascinated uh, by, by human imagination, also in literature, but I'm not so, so fond of fantasy genre. But I mean stories where, where you are told a, a fantastic story, but it's told by a, a, a certain person, like Alice in Wonderland. It's not just uh, a wonderland we are presented for, but it is Alice's wonderland because she falls asleep. So we understand that all the things that is happening in the wonderland is actually a sort of a psychological portrait of a young girl. If you told me a dream you have had, you would actually give me two informations. You would tell me the funny story in the dream, but you would, would also tell me about yourself. So, so uh, also for my own writing, I always write books like Chinese boxes, so a, a story within the story because I need to, to have a narrator around the, the more, more fantastic story. If you think about your mother, what, what, are the deepest, de what is the deepest impression and what was the, um, the strongest influence on your life? Uh, actually, my mother was a teacher and also a writer. Uh, she was <laughs> very, very active. She was, I mean, if people said they didn't, couldn't uh, understand her her strength and uh, how she could be so active. 
but at the same time, and that is what I will much remember her for, is how much she took care of the family. And I don't mean only her own children and my father, but she was the one in both the two, my father's and my mother's uh, family, who always took care of people who, who, who needed care. She was a person uh, who, who, who had ambitions, <laughs> artistic ambitions very much, but never ever uh, uh, these, uh, her own artistic ambitions stopped her in taking care of other people. And I'm convinced that, uh, 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 that uh, having time for, for uh, empathy and, and to, to, to do something for other people will actually make you richer also as an artist. I mean, can I tell one certain story uh, about uh, uh, you know, sex roles? <laughs> mm -hmm. Just wait a second. Because Stört es den Ton sehr? Stört es den Ton sehr? Wenn der so hart drückt, okay. You know, I, uh, of course, uh, traveling around the world, you meet a lot of different uh, culture. Uh, maybe the, the strongest difference I have experienced is concerning sex roles between, let's say, Norway, my country, and Japan. I was in Japan interviewed about uh, uh, men. Uh, if I myself had stayed at home taking care of children, and I said it's quite normal, and I told uh, the newspapers that uh, I stayed more at home than my my wife, uh, for she had more, more work, and then, uh, you know, they, 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 sorry. Ah, so I think you, can, you can take it from here, okay? Yeah, sure. You know, uh, when I was uh, in Japan some years ago, I, I uh, told some journalists that uh, in Norway it's quite normal that a man is carrying a child or, or, or staying at home taking care of the child while the wife is working. And I even said that I actually stayed more at home than my wife because I didn't have full work. And this was written about in Japanese newspapers. Then I was interviewed and among all magazines. It was the Japanese Playboy magazine. And they, he said, really, you stayed at home for how many hours? All the day, I mean, all the week. Uh, and, and, but what did you do then? You know what I mean? No, I don't know what you mean. What did you do with the baby? You know what I mean? No, I, I don't know what you mean. Yes, I mean, when you had to change diapers of the baby. I said, well, I changed diapers, washed the baby and put it back to sleep. And he said, really? And then I said, but still you, 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 you had time to write all these books. And I had to say, yes. and. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't have written the books without the inspiration of, 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 of bringing, is, is staying with children. And so, you, I mean, it, it's not necessarily uh, so that uh, uh, the less you are together with children or elder people, or the, the less uh, time you have to concentrate on your art. So, is it necessary for the men to develop more the female part in him and for the uh, women maybe the male part and how do you see that uh, in the future the relation between the sexes uh, will develop will there be still families or will there be other forms of relationships I'm maybe I'm a little conservative there because I believe in the family you know and I think that uh, it's a good thing to have a mo mother and a father living together of course a lot of people they experience that father lives there and mother there and th then they are going visiting the, the two of them. Uh, but I, I think that uh, uh, definitely after the women's liberation it has been a gift to man, to the men. Uh, because I think... You know, I can just go back to my answer. Uh, maybe con concerning you know, family life I'm a little uh, conservative because I, I believe in the family. <laughs> And, and uh, I think it's uh, absolutely a good thing for children to grow up in a house with both mother and father. Uh, today, of course, many are divorced, and, and that is, of course, a, a reflection of our modern society. But I think the, the woman's liberation has been maybe the most important uh, thing that happened in Western countries in the last uh, uh, half of, of uh, the 20th century. Uh, I, I think that it has been a gift to, to men. And a lot of, lot of men now admit this, you know, because men didn't really know uh, the value of having close relationships 
to children and so on before they start to say we're forced to. In my country, they are forced to, because when the, a woman has a permission, uh, you know, with payment uh, after getting uh, a child, then also the man gets money for a period if he stays at home. And, and then, of course, then men, uh, they, they take uh, these weeks off and they stay at home. But maybe that is a good start for the relationship between the father and the, and the child. And I wouldn't say that uh, men should be less men, because I do think that it is absolutely to be a man, <laughs> also to take care of children, for instance. And I would absolutely not say that I think that women should be more men. Oh, no, that is not, not a good thought. I think uh, women should be as much women as possible and men as much men. But I think that we have sort of uh, not uh, realized that uh, a part of being a man can be also giving love and care to children. So if we want to establish a culture of peace, uh, we, we have... If we want to establish a culture of peace, we have to deal with exactly the issue of emotions, because most of the wars, most of the conflicts, uh, they are not rationally planned, but they are out of an emotional situation. So how, how do you find, or how can we find a balance uh, between our aspirations, our ethics, and at the same time uh, of our emotions? I, I think that, uh, maybe it's very naive, but I think I have a very simple answer to this question. Because, of course, all human beings in the local community and in the global community don't always have the same interests. We are, we are discussing very much your interests versus my interests, you know? But, and, 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 and we will be angry with each other. And that, that is a natural thing. But I think that we should be learned, taught from, from the very early childhood that violence is absolutely intolerable. Absolutely intolerable. Uh, I think uh, 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 I have no other answer. I think that it, it, we should take it very seriously in the local community, in the classroom, in the schoolyard and at home. That, uh, I mean, I, I sometimes do this. If I see a child, I don't know him. If I see that he's sort of beating another boy, I go to him and say, what, what, what is this? this is incredible. How can you do this, you know? Uh, and uh, if the child is met by that, uh, I think it w would be easier to transfer this also to, to, to uh, armies, as a, I mean, you know, military. Uh, so, uh, of course, we need a police and we need a defense, uh, but, but uh, I think we should be taught everywhere, that, let's say the philosophy of, of, of Gandhi. Uh, saying that uh, that the violence is really ruining what we are trying to achieve, a victory won by violence, by by, by uh, you know, very often is actually a, a loss because what have you achieved? You achieved by the use of violence something that in the next stage will be threatened also by violence. I mean, so so I think that uh, very much uh, it, it sounds maybe naive, but I think we should concentrate much more on that in the whole homes and in the school. You know that this is also now an issue in the American uh, presidential uh, election campaign. Uh, so would you go so far to say that there should be a certain kind of censorship? Because obviously our entertainment industry in the world and uh, media and many artists, they are uh, doing the opposite. Uh, there is violence in all of the media mm. and entertainment. Mm. So what, what, how to do this? What is the responsibility of artists and uh, media in this regard? You know, artists, you know, they have always been fighting for, for human rights and for the freedom of the press, freedom of speech, you know, and for freedom, you know. Uh, so uh, I think it's a special, uh, because now we have achieved this freedom. Very many places also artists can say that, well, I, I do this even though you don't like it, and I do it in the name of, of the human rights or in the name of the arts. But today I think this is uh, more or, or less uh, a, a wrong way of thinking, because you cannot only talk about rights and freedom, you must also talk about responsibility. I've seen many exhibitions, art exhibitions, I've seen films, uh, very, very violent and, 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 and even macabre. I mean, like a new video, I saw a rock video, it was a, a, it was necrophile. Uh, story in it, you know. I felt it was disgusting. So, uh, also, you mentioned the American uh, debate. I think absolutely that there are too much uh, violence presented uh, uh, for, for, for children. Absolutely. 
and I, 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 I know there are stories we can see from, from the courthouse, you know. Uh, uh, the explanation in the final end is that this young boy committed this crime, he's saying himself, after seeing, for instance, natural born killers or something like that. So, so I think we should be actually a little more respective on that. And I should, should of course, think that in America they should have much, much more uh, strong laws concerning uh, distribution of armed weapons. You know. so there are two or three more questions. Yes. Mm. Um, what is your vision for the 21st century? Uh, if, if I have one wish for, for the next uh, century, for this century, uh, or for this millennium even, uh, it, it, it is uh, that we can really manage now in the modern world to take care of the environment. I mean, it, it took some billion years to create us. But will we survive this millennium? That is my question. Uh, the, 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 what is the arts? What is arts culture? Art is the celebration of human consciousness. Shouldn't then the artist be the first to defend it from annihilation? But you can say that uh, nature will take care of itself, so it's maybe not to protect nature so much, uh, but uh, to, to secure the survival of the human race by this. Yes, I'm talking very much about surviving uh, of the human race. But of course, if we destroy the environment, uh, we will sort of uh, destroy our own habitat, <laughs> our own existence. Some people, I beat sometimes people, you know, uh, in, in so, sort of new age movements saying that uh, this earth, Gaia, you know, mm -hmm. suffers now. She is ill. She is ill. The earth is ill. But, and we are killing her. We are the bacteriums that are killing her. And now she will get rid of us. Mm -hmm. I could, couldn't ever think uh, that. Because, I mean, I'm too much a humanist. And I think that, uh, well, I think anyway that this planet is m a much more splendid place with the human consciousness also. So I am uh, working for also in practice for, for uh, environment on Earth because I do absolutely think that we now have a political and economical system that is on a sort of a collision course with the limits set by nature. Um, here at the forum, uh, the idea was uh, to have a gathering of the wise people of the world um, uh, to develop a blueprint for the 21st century and to maybe guide politicians. Do you think uh, it would be a good idea to set up a council of wise people which uh, would have an, a role of uh, an advisory role without having interests? like most of the politicians or states have? Actually, the, the, the former government in Norway, they did in Norway make such a commission. They called it a value commission <laughs> or council, you know? Uh, and it was, as you said, w competent people without responsibility. And uh, it has been a great debate in, in Norway whether this uh, way of organizing things ha has any use. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, the importance of this conference, Forum 2000, is that a lot of people who work in different fields concerning human uh, future, you know, uh, they meet with, with a great of other people around the conference, many, many people. Uh, we listen to each other, we debate, and we, then we are spread all around the world. And I bring this forum conference from Prague with me to Oslo. Last time I was here in 97, uh, I, I got a lot of new reflections, new perspectives, and new knowledge. And since that, I have Everywhere I have been, I've also been all around the world. Uh, I had uh, the inspiration from the forum conference with me. So I, I don't know, maybe I believe uh, more in, uh, in this value of the conference. Uh, of course, one could wish that uh, this conference had more press around the world. But uh, one always wants more uh, 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 attention. But I think that the, the value is very, very big, actually of this conference because so many people are returned back home in different societies. But uh, don't you think that uh, the, the representation here is, is not really fair to world population? Uh, because mainly there are white people here uh, and mainly men. Uh, so uh, probably wisdom is found more in other cultures too. And uh, so probably such a council of wise people should be constituted on a different basis. Uh, it's maybe not the well-known names which are the real wise people. I, I absolutely think that you have a very important point. Uh, of course the representation at this conference is uh, not 
perfect at all. For instance, there, there is nobody from the United States, actually, uh, no American uh, also. But w w if I have a vision, a really a vision, it is that uh, you know, we had a committee making the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. What if, as you propose, take some people from all, all continents, you know, uh, trying to make a Universal Declaration of Human Obligations, as Helmut Schmidt proposed uh, uh, at the uh, 97 conference. Uh, if more people from Africa, for instance, uh, if uh, they took more part in making uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it would be a paragraph about paying respect and taking care of your parents. And so, so I think that there are, are uh, what you do find very much in the Western world is the focus on rights. But I think often in the third world you have more focus on obligations. And, and that's why I think uh, uh, such a representation would be very important. I must uh, uh, say though that the last thing I listened to before we met for this interview was uh, 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 an Indian politician and, and, and uh, thinker. And uh, so he, he presented a very important perspective into this conference. Thank you very much for the interview. Uh, thank you.